trends, global politics and deep analytics made by Ukrainian journalists to the whole world. Ukraine is at the doorstep of total blackout. Russia tries out NATO's readiness. Sam it's week. Ukraine is on the spotlight. This is Spotlight Ukraine. More of this right now. While the G20 leaders were meeting and calling for an end of the war, Russia was launching massive strikes on Ukrainian cities. On November 15th, the occupiers carried out one of the largest terrorist attacks since the beginning of the full-scale war. The Russians targeted 15 energy facilities in Ukraine. 10 million people across the country were left without electricity. Even in Moldova, electricity was cut off due to an attack on the Ukrainian power system. Is Ukraine at risk of energy collapse due to Russian attacks? We give you the answer right now. A high-rise building in Kiev is on fire after being hit by debris from a Russian missile. It seemed like a flaming bullet. I leaned over to the sofa and heard a loud explosion. Then I looked out the window and saw that the neighbor's balconies were on fire. I was lost for words at first. I only started crying the next day and understood all this horror. A person was burned alive in our building. On November the 15th, six Ukrainians were killed and another 17 were injured. The office of the president of Ukraine reported. The occupiers fired 96 rockets and 10 kamikaze drones on the entire territory of Ukraine. All shahats and 77 missiles were shot down by Ukrainian air defense. Run away! Run away! But even so, the consequences of shelling are very large scale. 10 million people were left without electricity. It's horrible hating people so much. For what? But we will survive against our enemies. It seems to me that this tactic is to tie people out and to think that it exhausts us and to think that it exhausts us. But it won't be like that. We are strong and we will win. Additional fan outages were immediately announced throughout the country. However, experts are sure that there will be no complete blackout in Ukraine. Our energy system is quite extensive and allow us to avoid this connection of all settlements. If it isn't possible to transfer on 330 line, we can to transfer a lower voltage on the 110 line. But then the power engineers have to manually switch these stations. That's why there is a shortage of electricity. Energy workers repair power lines quickly. On the morning of November the 16th, 80% of Ukrainian subscribers already had electricity. But the restoration of destroyed transformers is not a matter of one month. Therefore, the only guarantee of the stability of Ukraine's energy system is reliable anti-aircraft protection of critical infrastructure facilities. During Russia's mass shelling of Ukrainian cities on November 15th, one of the missiles fell on the territory of Poland. Two people died in the border village of Przewodów. The Associated Press, citing anonymous sources in the U.S. government, wrote that two Russian missiles crossed the airspace of Poland. But later, President Biden made a statement that there is no reason to say that the missile was launched from Russia. It was probably a Ukrainian air defense missile, he added. But no matter whose missile fell on Poland, Russia bears full responsibility for it, officials in the White House emphasized. 
Similar statements were made by the Prime Minister of Canada, the Secretary General of NATO and the Head of Diplomacy of the European Union. At the same time, Polish President Andrzej Duda noted that there is absolutely nothing to indicate that the missile incident in Przewodów was a deliberate attack by Russia. He added that it was most likely a Ukrainian air defense missile and that was an accident. However, President Zelensky assures that it was not our air defense missile. And the Secretary of the National Security and the Defense Council, Alexei Danilov, said the Ukraine is ready to provide evidence of Russian traces. Let's discuss the accident in Poland with our first guest. Radosław Sikorski, Poland's former foreign affairs and defense minister, joins us now. Hi, hello and welcome. Uh, but my first question is, how did the NATO bloc allow missiles to fall? Because the bloc itself says that the monitoring system on the border detected the flying rockets on the territory of Poland. Sure. Um, I, I don't think Ukraine can protect all of its territory. You are uh, quite effectively protecting major population centers. I don't think there is a country in NATO or in the world, in fact, that uh, that can protect its entire territory. Uh, and anti-aircraft and anti-missile defenses are a, 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 an Achilles heel in Poland, actually. We are protecting the Rzeszów hub, where the majority of Western assistance uh, for Ukraine is going through. Yep. Um, but you, you, it's physically impossible to protect your every farm and every village in any country. Poland agreed to give Ukrainian experts access for investigation of the tragic uh, accident in Przewodów. Let's assume uh, this is Ukrainian anti-missile rocket that was launched to catch the Russian one. What are the consequences of this? This is what we are assuming in Poland. You can't really argue with AWACS and with the Polish radars that, have, that tracked uh, the Russian strike against Ukraine and Ukrainian uh, efforts to defend themselves. And if an old Soviet-made anti-missile or anti-aircraft missiles misfired or, or its mechanism its, its self-destruct mechanism didn't work properly. That is not the fault of Ukraine. There is consensus in NATO and here in Poland that the uh, responsible party for what happened in Poland is Russia. It's Russia that is trying to pound Ukraine into submission. It's Russia that's committing war crimes by hitting civilian targets in Ukraine. It's Russia that is trying to uh, cause a wave of refugees by um, denying Ukraine electricity and heat uh, at the beginning of winter, it, you have the right to defend yourself. And if your self-defense forces uh, interceptor misfunctioned, um, we grieve for our citizens, obviously, but we don't blame you. And uh, there should be no compunction between friends and allies to admit the facts. You know, this is the difference between us in the Western civilization and those in um, autocracies. We base our policy on facts, not on fictions. And if the facts are a little difficult to explain, but defend themselves, as they do in this case, uh, you don't need to, um, to, 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 to stick to a version that is not credible. Uh, Democrats and allies tell each other the truth even when it's uncomfortable. Yeah, but uh, talking about the facts, why then the President Zelensky keeps denying that that was a Ukrainian missile? Look, I get it. In a, in a war situation, you um, pose um, hypotheses, working hypotheses. Uh, some of the time they get confirmed, and some of the time they disproved by additional evidence. I understand that President Zelensky today is already uh, uh, changing or, or, or modifying his uh, position. He was probably 
told by your uh, air defense forces uh, uh, what they thought was uh, was the case. Um, it, it's you know among serious people, it is not a dishonor to change your view in the light of additional evidence. So um, you understand we, such a reaction and uh, such a position of the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian president, well, right? Not only do I understand, I sympathize. For you, Putin is, is devil incarnate. This is a, a tyrant, a thief, and a war criminal. And it's perfectly natural for you to think that whatever evil happens in Ukraine or around Ukraine, Putin must be to blame. And, uh, and Putin is to blame because he launched this barrage of missiles against yeah. Ukraine, uh, against which you are trying to defend yourself. And if one of your Soviet um, missiles, uh, you know, doesn't self-destruct in time, it's still Putin who is to blame. Um, we understand the emotions. It's just that uh, we need to stick to the to, to, to the actuality, to the facts. Um, I got another question. Uh, do you think that such a reaction of the West can possibly play along Russian propaganda? Because we know the fact that Kremlin keeps stating that Ukrainian weapons given by the Western countries end up on the black markets and used by terrorists, so-called, and blah, blah, blah. Well, of course they do that. Uh, and that's why it's not uh, uh, sensible to um, overinterpret the evidence or jump to conclusions, uh, which is why I'm glad that President Zelensky has now modified his position, uh, because... Um, this is a, a, how we are different from the Russians. You know, we tell our people and our allies the truth, and they lie. Their system is based on thievery and lies. Our system is based on trust and, and truth-telling and, and, and credibility vis-a-vis -vis your own people and your allies is a very precious commodity, and it should be maintained. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for being with us. That was uh, Radoslav Sikorsky, Poland's former foreign affairs and defense minister. Thank you. And we got another guest to discuss the latest news and trends with Andrius Kubilius, the member of the European Parliament, who joins me now. Pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. So, uh, weather conditions are getting worse in Ukraine uh, due to large-scale Russian shelling. The Ukrainian energy system is on the verge of the total collapse. How will Europe help survive this winter? Well, exactly today in the Foreign Affairs Committee and Development Committee joint uh, meeting, we were discussing those issues, how EU uh, you know what what you need to do in order to provide uh, uh, humanitarian assistance i was recently visiting uh, lutsk uh, rivne and kiev uh, just few days after both lutsk and rivne were attacked uh, the first time by by russian missiles uh, so-called electricity distribution centers were hit it and i was discussing with local authorities what uh, what they need for the winter and and uh, as I understood, one of the priorities is electricity uh, generators, portable ones. And today I raise a question, because uh, it appears that uh, at least what we got information from Ukrainian uh, government, that they need around 25,000 uh, uh, electricity generators. Uh, and uh, today we got an information from EU authorities that uh, till now EU was able to provide some around of 700 uh, generators in, 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 in total. So I was raising the question, uh, who is going to, uh, to, you know, to provide uh, the rest ones, uh, which is around of, you know, 20,000. And, uh, well, I hope that both the EU and, uh, you know, cities from, me, from European member states, local communities from European states, can coordinate their efforts really uh, to provide what is needed for Ukraine in order really put uh, not to allow Putin to win with this what we call winter war. And I absolutely sure that you know we shall do what uh, we need to do because the war which uh, Ukraine is fighting is also our war. Yeah, it's good to hear. But now let's get back to the accident in Poland. 
How was Poland's statement regarding the fall of two missiles in Przewodów accepted in Europe? Will military support for Ukraine decrease as a result? Well, of course, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, tragic accident uh, was very much uh, uh, discussed in all, uh, you know, in all the, at least in European Parliament. Yesterday we had a special meeting of, again, of two committees, uh, which was the whole devoted to that issue. Uh, definitely, we are still waiting for some kind of, you know, more of information, uh, which uh, missile from why, uh, you know, uh, was 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 sent and so on. But in any case, this is responsibility of uh, Russia. Uh, everything, all those tragedies which are happening, and this is, you know, consequence of terrorist war which uh, Russia is waging against Ukraine. And exactly today, we were discussing in uh, among uh, political groups, and we agreed on special resolution, which was we will be uh, voted next uh, week in Strasbourg, and which uh, will uh, recognize that Russia is a state which is sponsoring terrorism, and Russia is a state which is uh, using terrorist means. And then we are saying what, you know, what consequences of that recognition should be uh, implemented, including uh, raising the question about uh, Russia as a terrorist state uh, being member of uh, United Nations Security Council. Uh, that membership should be suspended. On another side, of course, weapons and protection of, uh, you know, anti-missile weapons for Ukraine should be delivered on a much larger uh, scale. And uh, I am always raising the question that EU, in uh, delivering uh, the weapons, is still quite uh, heavily behind what, uh, for example, the United States of America are doing. So I hope that also EU will uh, raise its its you know capabilities in delivering uh, in delivering uh, Ukraine the needed weapons. Uh, yeah, but uh, due to this tragic uh, tragic uh, due to this tragic accident in eastern Poland, whether NATO will strengthen air defense along NATO's eastern borders. Well, I think yes, of course, you know, but. Uh, I would be rather even more happy that uh, uh, that NATO should uh, strengthen uh, the defense of Ukrainian borders, you know, and and Ukrainians uh, airspace, because uh, it's very clear that uh, this terroristic war which uh, Russia waged uh, against Ukraine, uh, which she is losing on uh, military fronts, but then she is attacking uh, you now civilian. Uh, infrastructure, energy infrastructure of Ukraine is, you know, is spreading, uh, is spreading to other countries. A uh, few weeks ago, we saw how Russian missile landed in Moldova. Now we saw, you know, the tragedies in Poland. And uh, definitely the major goal should be, first of all, uh, uh, to uh, end this war, but uh, the war can be ended only if Ukrainians will manage to defeat Russian uh, uh, Russian army, and that will depend very much on how much weapons they will get from the West. Of course, the borders of uh, NATO countries also should be strengthened, but first of all, we need to win this war, you know, our war, and uh, and that is what we are going to do. Yeah, yeah, everyone hopes that. Thank you so much. That was Andreas Kubilius, the member of the European Parliament. Thank you for being Thanks with us. Thanks a lot. This is Spotlight Ukraine. Like, share and subscribe. Ukraine liberated more than half of the territory captured by Russia since February 24. The main battles are now concentrated on the Donetsk front line. Now the heaviest battles are in the Bakhmut and Uhlidar areas. Melitopol became the main strategic city in the southern direction because the main railway routes for the supply of troops passed through it. The latest state of affairs on the front right now. Southern Front, Kherson, Zaporizhia. The Ukrainian military liberated Kherson city in a day. 
meeting virtually no resistance from the remaining Russian forces, despite the estimations that the battle will take days, if not weeks. Following the liberation of the right bank of the Kherson region, the armed forces of Ukraine keep the other bank under the fire control. All railways and roads leading both from Crimea and Zaporizhia are under either artillery or HIMARS fire. Therefore, Russian troops are relocating artillery and military equipment 15-30 kilometers deep in the region, away from the Dnipro River. The experts say this is the reason Kherson has not been shelled following its liberation, as has been expected before. Meanwhile, the armed forces of Ukraine have new targets. They are shelling Russian manpower clusters near the Dnipro River, particularly near Oleshki, Novakakhovka, Hornostaevka and Holopristan settlements. Also, since their range has increased, they now can reach more targets, such as the airfield in Chaplinka, Kherson region, where Russian troops have stationed their base. The withdrawal of the major part of Russian forces from the Dnipro River provides advantageous conditions for Ukrainian paratroopers who have landed near Kinburn Spit and Oleshki and are trying to gain a foothold and establish a base for the left bank attack. These maneuvers caused some Russian units to retreat from Skadovsk and Genichesk districts. Melitopol is now the main strategic point of the southern front line, since all railway roads lie through the city. However, the city falls within the reach of HIMARS. Therefore, the only ways for Russia to supply its southern front forces are the railway going through the Crimean Bridge, which operates only partly, and road connections linking Mariupol, Berdyansk, Melitopol, which is the only road in that direction not being shelled by the AFU. Russia is currently deploying the majority of its forces to Melitopol. The battle for this city will be decisive for liberating the entire of southern Ukraine and Crimea. Inhabitants of Kherson continue to recover from the horrors of the Russian occupation. They live without electricity, without water, without sewage, but hopefully without Russia. As they say, now we are free people. About the return of life to her son, our fresh journalists review. During stabilization measures in the liberated city of Kherson, officers of the Security Service of Ukraine and the National Police of Ukraine discovered a torture chamber where the Russian occupiers interrogated and tortured pro Ukraine residents of Kherson. One of the most notorious sites was a local police station at number no. 3 Energy Workers Street. Inside the facility, a set of empty garages graffitied inside, reading Russia Z, lay at the back of a courtyard past a smashed portrait of Vladimir Putin, left lying on the ground. The regional chief prosecutor, Volodymyr Kalucha, says that his office has identified over 43 people that had been tortured in the police department's detention facility during Russian occupation. We know about torture chambers on the liberated territories of Kherson region, and we have already inspected them. We are working on identifying torture victims and their family members, as well as witnesses. Maxim, 45, a resident of Kherson who fought for Kiev in eastern Ukraine before the full-scale invasion began in February, said he was arrested on March 15th, was held there for three weeks. Do you know what was the most horrifying thing? I could hear the whole day long how the others were being tortured. There were horrifying screams. To me personally, this was the most horrible experience. The torture methods used here we have heard of are beating with rubber and wooden butts, electrocutions and forcing people to wear gas masks. Russian forces detained three categories of civilians, people suspected of being pro-Ukrainian underground guerrillas, relatives of Ukrainian soldiers, as well as government employees who declined to take jobs in the occupation administration. A different detention center in Kherson was not accessible to reporters because investigators were still demining it. 
Meanwhile, the locals return to their usual life and recover from the horror of the occupation. They gathered in the downtown Kherson to receive humanitarian aid, to charge their phones from a generator installed in the central square and to talk to each other. We came for humanitarian aid for our children. We are short for diapers, baby food for those who can't be fed with breast milk. Porridges, milk porridges, that was the hardest thing to come by. The main thing is that there is enough for our children and adults will get over somehow. Our children had to feel that we are liberated and thank God Ukraine is here again and we are not abandoned. What a joy. Along with food, people cured to get some medical help near a mobile clinic set up by a volunteer from Vancouver. Mark Voyager, military analyst, former advisor to commander of the U.S. Army in Europe, joins me now. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you for inviting me. Um, on your opinion, which city will be liberated next after Kherson? Well, I would like uh, to see all Ukrainian cities be being liberated and the sooner the better. Because yeah, everyone the wants to, the, terrible, to see that, yeah. Terrible toll, toll that the Russian occupation is exacting on uh, the Ukrainian population. Um, but look, I think uh, um, obviously um, um, any any cities east of uh, where forces are, uh, are now, I mean, your forces will have to first, uh, of course, establish themselves on the left bank of the, of the, of the river. Uh, after having uh, uh, retaken and liberated Kherson, so I would imagine an, an, an offensive uh, in the in the direction uh, in the eastern direction would make uh, more sense. You know, I'm obviously not privy to what your um, uh, command is doing in your general staff, uh, but um, an advance uh, to the east, uh, Melitopol and other cities in the area, uh, would um, actually put the Russian forces in Crimea in extremely difficult uh, position. And also, of course, uh, uh, it'll be great to see some sort of a counteroffensive to push uh, the Russian force away from uh, cities like the towns and cities like Bakhmut and, and others, uh, so that they can secure uh, this uh, strategic direction, the strategic communication nodes, and of course, uh, prepare the groundwork for uh, liberating Donetsk and, and the entire uh, Donetsk uh, region. Yeah, thank you. Uh, winter's coming. To what extent winter can slow down the Ukrainian counteroffensive? And, and who will benefit from these extreme cold conditions, Ukrainian army or the Russians instead? Uh, well, as you quite well know, um, traditionally there have been two fighting seasons. Uh, um, uh, this, the summer one in uh, late September, uh, late August, uh, and, uh, mid September, which was the case in 2014. And then uh, the winter fighting season, which uh, usually starts around mid-January uh, till mid-February, uh, which was the case in 2015 when the Russians took over uh, Donetsk uh, airport. Um, uh, but in this case, of course, uh, the challenge for the Russians is that they uh, they have lost the initiative. Uh, they're fighting on uh, on um, uh, foreign uh, hostile territory. Um, you have a uh, tremendous advantage, uh, the momentum, the, uh, the training, the uh, weapon systems that you, uh, that you uh, receive from the West. Um, the, uh, the planning is, is uh, uh, superior, the planning on the Ukrainian side, and the overall preparation for the war. And so um, I don't anticipate your forces being slowed down by the winter. Um, also, on top of that, as you quite well know, uh, the, the so-called frozen land um, um, phenomenon allows for the, uh, for the movement of uh, heavy armor, that is tanks, um, yeah, yeah. carries and others. So I would say um, I don't expect the, um, your forces to, be, to slow down, uh, and the winter will be very difficult for the, uh, for the Russian forces, and they got to prepare for a serious offensive on your end, I think. So this way, uh, that's why actually Putin would be desperate to reach some sort of a, um, of a um, um, agreement, um, so he can try to freeze the conflict. At least that that's that's that will be his uh, midterm uh, objective. I don't think your uh, politicians uh, would agree to that. I don't think your military will stop, uh, but we can expect uh, more overtures on the Russian side, trying to convince the world and, and the West that supposedly Russia is ready to negotiate, but you are pushing for for con continuing the war. 
uh, again, uh, see a very difficult winter uh, for uh, the Russian forces, and your forces will keep advancing, in my opinion. Do you anticipate that there could be any kind of negotiations between Ukraine and Russia even before the winter starts? I don't see uh, why this would happen. As I said, uh, I, I'm just saying what the, uh, the, in the in the mind of Putin and his leadership, oh. given the uh, the miserable uh, state of affairs of, of their forces currently and the uh, um, humiliating defeats, uh, it would be logical uh, from their point of view if they could try at least try to uh, reach some sort of an agreement to uh, to try to halt the Ukrainian advances. I don't see your uh, political elite, your president, your government agreeing on any negotiations. I don't see an appetite in the West to push uh, your leadership uh, in the direction of uh, uh, negotiate uh, uh, settlement or ceasefire. Uh, I think it's been stated clearly uh, that um, First and foremost, Ukraine has to restore its sovereignty, liberate its territories, and then, only then, we can uh, even uh, begin to talk, to, to think of negotiating with, with Russia. And, and who in Russia are going to talk, are going to, talk to Putin, the international uh, terrorist and, and mass murderer? Obviously, that, that would be unacceptable. And so, um, I don't see the prospect of serious, I don't see any serious appetite or uh, for any negotiations to, of this nature. Thank you. And now let's draw some attention to another Ukrainian neighboring country, Belarus. So let's assume if Belarus dares to fully intervene in the war in order to cut off the arteries of Western aid, how likely is this and will it change the situation on the Eastern Front? Well, they, they didn't do it uh, last year. Uh, that was the time when maybe such a move would have made more sense and they would have maybe had more success. Um, in other words, um, contributing forces to the uh, Russian advance, advance toward uh, Kiev and also trying to cut off uh, uh, communications back then. Uh, nowadays, with the amount of uh, weapons that you receive from the West, with, uh, with the training uh, you know, that your uh, forces have, with the, um, um, with the overall uh, um, disposition of the forces, I don't see how... Uh, I don't see the the number of forces in Belarus uh, that in terms of capabilities, and I don't see the uh, also the will to fight within the uh, 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 sorry the um, Belarusian uh, um, leadership or, uh, or military uh, to to lead them to success. I mean, yeah, they could launch some sort of an attack, but how successful is it going to be? Obviously, you know the terrain is quite difficult uh, in this Polesia uh, region. Um, and, and obviously, this will be met uh, with a strong reaction by the West, by NATO, especially after the um, incident uh, near the Polish border. Imagine if, uh, on top of that, is, uh, the West sees a massive movement of troops from the direction of Belarus. The first thing the Poles are going to think: Well, what are, what are they going to? What are they up to? When, when are they going to cross the border in our direction? Probably. So this will. I mean, there will be a tremendous pressure on the on the part of the West against uh, Lukashenko. Uh, I don't think he's interested in um, uh, also contributing uh, uh, so prominently to this uh, disastrous war. Everybody can see that Russia's army is a Putyonkin uh, formation. It's a terrorist uh, gang, really, of uh, yeah. rapists and murderers. So, you know, I, I cannot rule it out. Of course, your military must be planning for this, and I'm sure they are. Uh, but, um, you know, I don't see them, the Belarusians contributing, uh, other, than, other than allowing the Russians to operate out of Belarusian airspace and hitting targets in Ukraine. That's actually the greater damage than uh, in Belarusian forces uh, moving uh, at this stage uh, against Ukraine. Yeah, thank you so much for your answers. That was Mark Voyager, the military analyst and former advisor to commander to the U.S. Army in Europe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's build Ukraine together. A youth camp of volunteers helps restore buildings damaged by rockets in the Kyiv region. Our journalists will tell about their work and how to get involved in really good deeds. A Russian rocket hit the dormitory of the Makariv College in the spring, when part of the Kyiv region was under occupation. 
The college is already opened, but the students have nowhere to live. Volunteers of the youth construction camp undertook to restore their dormitory. So that students can return here as soon as possible, because for many it is the main home. Among the students there are orphans as well as children from families who have found themselves in difficult circumstances. American Andrew blasters one of the dormitory rooms on the second floor. His parents are emigrants from Lviv, so boy isn't indifferent to the war in Ukraine. For two days he traveled by plane and bus to the Kyiv region and joined the volunteer camp. I like it. I am engineer by education in the United States. In the USA, I joined of a similar volunteer organization which builds houses for poor people. In a few days at the camp, Andrew has improved his Ukrainian skills, and other boys and girls call him Andriy. The team gathered from all over Ukraine. Helga from deoccupied Kherson now lives in Kiev and tries to be useful to the country. Isn't difficult for me to work with. I party primed. We do everything equally. There is nothing that girls can do. For example, yesterday I was repairing electrical wiring. Construction work isn't difficult, girl says. The Building Ukraine Together camp has been operating since 2014. Before a full-scale war, volunteers mostly worked in Donbass. And now they help to restore destroyed infrastructure in the Kyiv region. In Russia's war with Ukraine, the Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate plays not the least role. From the first days of the full-scale invasion, it proves itself as a powerful propaganda organization. Priests bless Russian soldiers for the war with Ukraine, teach them how to load weapons and tell believers horror stories about the European Union and the United States. At the same time, the Russian patriarchs complain to the European public about the oppression of the church in Ukraine. Ukrainian priests loyal to them are used as agents of the Russian special services. How Russia covers up its crimes in Ukraine in the name of God. See in our review. They are called FSB agents in Kassaks. 33 priests of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate, who are suspected of collaborating with the enemies, were exposed by the security service of Ukraine during nine months of full-scale war. The clerics adjusted Russian missiles and passed on important information to the occupiers. The Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate has supported military aggression against Ukraine since the first days. Our spiritual mobilization, to which I now call everyone, will also help the mobilization of all our forces. Our spiritual mobilization, to which I now call everyone, will also help the mobilization of all the forces of our motherland. And this will undoubtedly contribute to the complete reconciliation of Russia and Ukraine which are the single space of the Russian Orthodox Church. Where did Ukraine want to go? Ukraine wanted to join the European Union. And this is like some obsessive idea. And what does the modern European Union and the United States do? Collective West, they defend sin. Moscow priests consecrate tanks and bless soldiers for the war with Ukraine and even teach them how to load weapons. Now let's consecrate these war machines so that the Lord will send the guardian angel over them. Let the power of God come upon this weapon in attack and defense, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What we see now is primarily a spiritual war, and I would like to teach you how to properly load cartridges so that they fly to the target. That is why the Holy Fathers teach us that when you take a cartridges, you load it and say the following words, Holy Mother and God, save us. 
For many years, the Russian church in Ukraine has been preparing a powerful agent network from its priests. Many high-ranking officials are members of the Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. Therefore, there is still no political decision to ban the activities of the Moscow Church in Ukraine, although such a draft law was registered in the Verkhovna Rada in the spring. But several local councils have already made such decisions. Meanwhile, the Pope met with the head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church for the first time since the beginning of the full-scale war. Svetoslav Shevchuk presented the pontiff with fragments of a Russian rocket that hit a Ukrainian church in the city of Irpin. Currently, the Ukrainian site does not comment on the details of Shevchuk's visit to the Vatican. During the last meeting with the pilgrims, Pope Francis called not to put up with the war in Ukraine. He publicly condemned Russian aggression. At the same time, some of the Pope's statements are incomprehensible to Ukrainians. They even outrage people who have suffered from Russian bombs. In particular, returning from the religious forum in Bahrain, the Pope emphasized that he is convinced that the brutality of the Russian occupiers in the war against Ukraine isn't characteristic of the Russian people, whom he considers a great nation. The words of the pontiff are quoted by Vatican News. And then the preaching for peace. What strikes me, that's why I use the word tormented for Ukraine, is the cruelty, which is not of the Russian people, perhaps, because the Russian people are a great people. It is one of the mercenaries, of the soldiers who go off to war as an adventure, mercenaries. I prefer to think of it this way, because I have high esteem for the Russian people, for Russian humanism. At the same time, Ambassador of Ukraine to the Holy See urges not to draw conclusions about the position of the Pope from one statement. This is how he commented the words of Pontiff to us. The Pope has most complete information about what is happening in Ukraine. In particular, since February 24th, our embassy has sent almost 200 official notes to the Holy See. However, we shouldn't draw conclusions about the position of the Pope from one of his statements. We must understand that his worldview was formed under the influence of various factors. That's why we see such statements. At the same time, the Pope constantly responds to events in Ukraine and prays for peace. And now let's talk about the world's politics. Hopefully we do have the global news editor Yuri Fizer who joins me now. Nice to see you, Yuri. Nice to see you, Volodymyr. So what has happened in the whole world the last week? Well, there were quite a few meetings uh, all around the globe. And what is uh, very important, that Ukraine was at the spotlight and all of them. Initially, the EU ministers of foreign affairs and EU ministers of defense met in Brussels to discuss European issues. Uh, and uh, they talked about Ukraine also. And then, far from Ukraine, at the Indonesian island of Bali, leaders of the so-called G20 group met also to discuss different global issues, but Ukraine was also at the agenda. And Putin had to be there, but he didn't come. Maybe he was afraid to. I don't know. But nevertheless, I would suggest to call this group uh, uh, G19 instead of G20. Uh, and maybe it's even in time to exclude Russia from this group. Maybe, maybe. But let's talk about G20 a bit later. And now let's draw our attention to uh, the support of Ukraine uh, from the European countries. Yes, uh, I have to say that Ukraine has got uh, assurances of full support uh, from the European Union. Uh, the ministers almost unanimously, with the exception of only the representatives of Hungary, confirmed that they will continue to provide us with the necessary military, financial and humanitarian support so that we can uh, successfully resist uh, Russian aggression. However, some unclear messages were also heard from Europe. For example, head of uh, European diplomacy, Josep Borrell, before the beginning of the meeting of the foreign ministers in Brussels, said that the European Union is not yet ready to uh, introduce new, new anti-Russian sanctions. And so, uh, why did he say this? What's uh, on the stake? I asked this to the 
special correspondent of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, Richard Joswiak, and this is what he answered in the exclusive interview to the Spotlight Ukraine. Mr. Joswiak, greetings and thanks for joining me today. Greetings, nice for having me. My first question, question to you would be as follows. So the European People's Party, the largest faction of the European Parliament, said in the statement uh, that uh, uh, at the plenary session that will start in Strasbourg on November 21st, uh, deputies plan to vote on the resolution uh, that would call Russia a terrorist state. So the question is, do you think other deputies will support this resolution? Yes, I think so. Uh, the European Parliament is uh, quite uh, strong when it comes to support for Ukraine. Uh, they're also freer to say these sort of things because they don't have the same, let's say, um, skin in the game. Uh, they, what the European Parliament, are allowed to say things that, for example, EU member states and, uh, and the European Commission, for example, can't say. Uh, because uh, they have bigger diplomatic clout. The European Parliament, uh, essentially, when it comes to foreign policy, don't take any binding decisions, which means that they can be a bit more offensive. So I think that the European uh, Parliament will pass a resolution calling Russia exactly this. And do you know, by the way, the exact day when uh, this resolution uh, can be voted? Uh, that will be on the Thursday, so I don't have a calendar in front of me, but uh, what will that be, the 24th, potentially? Okay, so uh, I hope uh, the, the resolution will be voted for. Uh, okay, I'm pretty Joseph. Sure it will pass. Mm -hmm. Josep Borrell, uh, the um, uh, head of European diplomacy, sat in Brussels uh, before the beginning of the meeting of the ministers of foreign, foreign affairs of countries, members of the European Union. He said that uh, the EU is not yet ready to discuss introducing new sanctions against Russia. What can this statement mean? It means that uh, there is a reality in the European Union that you need unanimity to pass sanctions. Every one, all 27 EU member states must agree. And uh, he knows that there is, uh, among a minority of member states, uh, a feeling that uh, they don't want to push even further with sanctions right now. The vast majority of member states want to go further, list people who should be have their assets frozen, who should get a visa ban, perhaps move to, to fill a few loopholes in the sanctions and so on. Uh, but at the moment, there is not a 100% appetite. So they are working towards what would be the ninth package of EU sanctions. I think there is still a fairly big chance that this will be agreed uh, before Christmas. Uh, but you still have have to work uh, a bit harder to convince everyone to agree on this. So speaking about this minority, they don't want new sanctions against Russia just at the moment or they don't want new sanctions at all? Um, I think it's a combination, but mainly they don't want any new sanctions at all. Uh, I mean, we all know that Hungary is the country that is most uh, vociferous in their sort of uh, opposition to new sanctions. They think that sanctions don't work. Uh, they claim that, you know, sanctions, if they were effective, should have stopped the war immediately. So, so they are not in favor of new sanctions. I think, however, which have been the case with Budapest for the last two, three sanction rounds, that as long as you don't touch uh, energy, and especially uh, Russian energy going to, to uh, Hungary, which means atomic energy, gas, and to a certain extent oil, uh, that they will be okay with sanctions in the end. But as you know, then the sanctions will be very weak. Uh, the last two, three packages for the EU has made have not been the strongest one. And I think we will continue to see these sort of more sanctions, but they will not be sanctions that substantially hit the Russian economy. Exclusive interviews also in Spotlight Ukraine. And now let's talk about G20 as one of the main topics uh, which has been discussed all, all over the world for the last couple of weeks. What was said about Ukraine in Indonesia? Well, I have to say, Volodymyr, that Ukraine was one of the main topics at G20 summit in Indonesia. Our issue was so important that Putin did not even come, maybe because he was scared to come, or maybe something else, I don't know. But his uh, foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, although he came, managed to stay there only for a day, and then he fled away. And all because most of the leaders condemned Putin's uh, war in Ukraine in the final day 
declaration they called this war terrible, even though Lavrov managed to convince uh, the participants to add a sentence saying that not all the leaders agreed uh, with the conclusion of the declaration. Uh, Putin was also urged to stop the war immediately and withdraw all his troops from uh, Ukraine. What's more? Everyone present did not mince words when describing the rocket attack against Ukrainian cities on Tuesday. And this is what, for example, said the President of the United States of America, Joe Biden. At the moment when uh, the world leaders here in Bali are seeking to make progress on global peace, spooky, Putin is striking civilian targets and children and women. And, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's almost... In my, my words, not yours, barbaric, what he's doing. And uh, Russia can and should stop the war. If they able to do it, they can stop it tomorrow if they wanted to. But uh, I'm glad we're on the same page. And now Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Let's uh, hear what he said at the G20 summit. While other world leaders were working together to tackle the greatest challenges our people face, Putin was launching indiscriminate attacks on civilians in Ukraine. In the wake of these attacks, today we held an urgent meeting of allies to underscore our solidarity with Ukraine and Poland. We should all be clear, none of this would be happening if it weren't for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This is the cruel and unrelenting reality of Putin's war. As long as it goes on, it poses a threat to our security and that of our allies. And as long as it goes on, it will continue to devastate the global economy. And Volodymyr, from what we have just uh, heard, maybe it's even good Putin, P Putin did not uh, come to G20 summit. Good for him, at least. Yeah, and good for the whole world. Uh, but not only G20, because this uh, week there were like more summits in Asia as well. Were the people and the politicians uh, in those summits talk about Ukraine? Yes, representatives of the Association of the Southeast Asian Nations met in Cambodia, and even there they talked about Ukraine. Moreover, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dmitro Kuleba, was there. He addressed the meeting, but more about this in our story. Ukraine joined the Association of Southeast Asian Nations Summit and a parallel East Asian Summit for the first time. Leaders of the United States, Japan, South Korea and Australia are among those also attending. At the summit, Ukraine Foreign Minister Dmitro Kuleba signed the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia, a peace pact among Southeast Asian countries established by ASEAN founding members and discussed during meetings with Southeast Asian leaders ways in which they can support Ukraine. Kuleba also urged Southeast Asian countries to take all measures possible to stop Russia from playing Hunger Games over a Ukrainian Black Sea grain deal. I called on all ASEAN members to take every measure possible to stop Russia from playing Hunger Games with the world. Grain corridor should be exempted from the conflict. Whatever happens on the battleground, Russia should not use this corridor as a blackmail, as a leverage in international relations. ASEAN partner status opens up a number of new opportunities for Ukrainian business, in particular in the fields of digital transformation, pharmaceuticals, agriculture and mechanical engineering. Now Ukrainian products will be able to enter the southeastern market and return money to the state economy. This agreement provides Ukraine with political and economic support in relations with the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Brunei Darussalam, Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, Cambodia. Yeah, and talking about the Asian region, um, many experts um, 
make some parallels between Ukraine and Taiwan. What about the relationship with this country? Yes, well, Demir, Taiwan helps us very much in our fight for freedom. We got a lot of help from uh, people living uh, there. Moreover, it is our promising trade partner with which uh, we need to develop bilateral relations. And, by the way, this is what deputies of uh, Verkhovna Rada do, in particular, Mykola Knyazhetsky. Taiwan provided Ukraine with more than uh, $30 million in humanitarian aid and jobs the sanctions against Moscow. Already on February 28th, Taiwan sent 27 tons of medical materials to Ukraine. Through a special fund, $33 million were collected to help Ukrainians. On February 25, Taiwan introduced sanctions against Russia and in the spring expanded the list by banning the export of a number of high-tech products, including microchips, lasers, navigation systems. And the brave warriors from Taiwan also help us to defend our freedom because they know very well the cost of this freedom. A Taiwanese man who volunteered to fight in Ukraine has died on the battlefield. Jonathan Sen is believed to be the first person from the island killed in the war. He was injured during combat in the eastern city of Luhansk and died from blood loss. Sen's death came as a shock to Taiwan in part because the involvement of Taiwanese volunteers in the Ukrainian International Legion and other forces has largely gone unnoticed. Taiwanese media reports that about 10 fighters from the island joined the, the fight. Tseng arrived in Ukraine in June and two months ago joined the Karpatska Siege Battalion. And before that, he completed five years of Taiwanese military training. Rest yeah. in peace. Yeah, rest in peace, the real hero. So, as far as I'm concerned, we do have the throughout support from all over the world, almost. But at this stage, do we really need to start the negotiations with Russia? Well, Demir, that's exactly what I want to, to ask my guest. This is former ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Mr. John Herbst. Mr. Herbst, uh, greetings and thank you for joining us. Mr. Herbs, uh, Western leaders more often start saying that uh, Ukraine needs negotiations with uh, Russia. Uh, right now, do we need them? And if so, under which conditions? Uh, eventually, this war of Russian aggression will be resolved through a diplomatic process. But right now, Moscow's aim is still to impose its political will on Ukraine. So Russia's not interested in a real negotiation. And R Ukraine is conducting a successful counteroffensive in the East and the South. And the United States should pr and the West should provide all the weapons Ukraine needs to make that counteroffensive as successful as po possible. Once Ukraine has taken a lot more territory back from Russia, Putin may realize that he must make peace on just terms. But right now, he's only interested in negotiations in which Ukraine would give him land that he has conquered, and that's unacceptable. What are the best negotiations for Ukraine right now? Is this uh, Ukrainian armed forces or maybe negotiations with Russia someday, somehow? Look, uh, there has been some loose talk from people who don't understand what Putin's objectives are about negotiations. The right course for us is to continue our military support for Ukraine for Ukraine to continue its counteroffensive, and then to see if Russia is willing to negotiate at some point, on a fair basis, its withdrawal from the territories of Ukraine, which it has taken first this year and then, for that matter, going back to 2014. Okay. And is the West getting tired uh, from helping us? What do you think? I think, by and large, Western support for Ukraine remains, remains strong. There was some talk about uh, the Trump wing of the Republican Party doing well in this election and insisting on dropping American assistance. But the Republicans did not do very well in the elections, and the Trump wing of the Republican Party did even worse. So I am confident that American support for Ukraine over the next two years will continue at least as strong as it is today. I would like us to do more, but I think at a minimum we will not do less. So you say that we really have this bipartisan support from the U.S. Congress right now? 
Yes. I mean, look, in the vote earlier this year, um, it's true that 25 percent of Republicans did not agree to send this large aid package to Ukraine. But 75 percent, which is a very large number, did agree. OK. Uh, Mr. Herbs, uh, let's talk a little bit about Poland, right. about this incident in Poland. And it showed that West is a little bit hesitant uh, in response to uh, Russia, to Russian threats. Uh, why? Well, I, I don't I, I mean, I'm not shy about criticizing the United States or other Western countries if I feel their policies are, are weak. But it seems that what fell in, in, in Poland was a Ukrainian-launched rocket, not a Russian-launched rocket. If that's true, I, I don't see anything weak about the Polish or the NATO or the American response to this. I think the response was appropriate. Okay, thank you very much. This was John Herbs, uh, former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. So this is all for today. See you next week. And now back to you, Vladimir. Thank you once again for uh, the good review and deep analytics about the world politics this week. Thank you, Yuri Fizer, our global news editor. And now let's get back to social media which is also active and has been active this uh, week as always. How users reacted to the liberation of her son and what other topics bothered our country? Let's see right now. While retreating from Kherson, Russians kidnapped animals from the local zoo. A private Crimean zoo, Taigan Lion Park, owned by Oleg Zubkov, filmed him grabbing raccoons by their tails and dumping them into cages in a YouTube video from Kherson. <laughs> <laughs> Social media in Ukraine exploded. Ukrainians want the raccoon back. Twitter user and strategic communication expert Lubov Tsibulska says. After such a robust social media reaction, the owner of Crimean Zoo, Oleg Zubkov, said that they are ready to return the stolen raccoon, as well as the other animals taken away from Kherson Zoo. However, Ukrainians will believe it only when the animals are actually back. Former Deputy Minister of Internal Affairs of Ukraine Anton Herashenko tweets, adding a funny edited. Also, this week marks the first snowfall in Ukraine hit by power cuts after Russian shelling. Power outages leave a lot of Ukrainians in the dark. However, there is always time for humor, even on such hard days for our country. Yevgeny Yasinsky makes a joke, saying that the general staff of the Ukrainian armed forces asks Ukrainians to not shoot down rockets with snowballs. The first snow actually started with massive air raid sirens, so another Twitter user shares her thoughts on the first snowfall. The expectation was, yes, no, it is time for the mulled wine, while the reality is. Twitter user Alina Hlazova sums up this topic, saying if the snowfall falls, so also Russia will. Why raccoon? Still don't get it. A real threat looms over the president. He had never been so close to defeat. This is how people joke on social media about the episode of the interview of President Zelensky and the First Lady to our colleagues from the CNN. Because Volodymyr Zelensky said, no one makes me breakfast. You'd better see the face of the First Lady at that moment. Yes, and what strength ah. do you get? Do what you I get have from, from you other? and yes. what you have from me. Yes. I know what you have from me. <laughs> exactly. You know. Yeah. <laughs> of course you know. I, if I can. Yes. Yeah. That, that is my love and that is my best friend. 
So that is my energy. I wanted to answer your question at the very beginning, when Olena told you like she prepared breakfast for, for the children in the morning and prepare clothes and etc. Uh, and and what, what I wanted to tell you that, uh, but I have no such possibility. So nobody gives me breakfast <laughs> in the morning. I, I mean that it's such such uh, such difficult period yeah. because you're living apart <laughs> Such sweet moments, but this episode proves one thing you can be the bravest president of the whole world Who's not afraid of anyone and anything but when you say that no one makes breakfast in front of your wife man You are in real trouble that was Spotlight Ukraine. Thank you for watching. Like, share and subscribe on our YouTube channel, Espresso Spotlight Ukraine. More news during the week. Find out there. See you next Friday. Do